This is going to be one of the most difficult videos I've ever had to make in terms of reviewing a video game. Because not only are we going to be taking a deep dive into Modern Warfare Zombies itself, but we are going to be examining the state of the community and how delicate things are right now. Modern Warfare Zombies is stirring up so much commotion, which is causing the community to turn on one another rather than turning that animosity outward and communicating respectfully with the developers. And to be honest, I get it. People are upset that their favorite franchise and their favorite mode is changing. They're mad that they have no idea what's in store for the future of COD Zombies, and they're frustrated that Treyarch really isn't responding or listening to what the community has been asking for since the end of 2020. And here is where things get even more messy. You see, Modern Warfare Zombies is actually pretty great. But, and this is a big but, my prediction here is that this is going to cause a huge problem for the future of the mode in the franchise because we are fracturing the player base even further further than it already is, creating even more slices of what is already a very tumultuous pie. And now you may be sitting there thinking to yourself at this point in the video, but skeptics, why is this happening? Well, let me do my best to explain. You see, over the course of Call of Duty's history, the idea of using the Modern Warfare IP and the concept of Call of Duty Zombies never really meshed in a way that felt justified to take this special co-op mode outside of the Black Ops series where it originated. And while there have been occasional exceptions to this rule and chances were taken by Activision to let the devs experiment, modes like Extinction, Exo Zombies, World War II Zombies, Infinite Warfare Zombies, they never really quite packed that punch that Treyarch Zombies could and generally does. So what changed? Well, Call of Duty Zombies has dealt with some serious misfires over the last five years or so. And with the shift in development cycles which pushed Treyarch's next Call of Duty release back to 2024, that meant fans wouldn't have a Zombies mode created by the lead Treyarch Zombies team for a little over over three years. So knowing full well that the zombies community has been growing restless, it seemed imperative that Treyarch dip their toes into the experimental waters to help calm the waves of distrust amongst fans until their next game releases, which hopefully brings back round-based zombies in full force. So that's why Modern Warfare Zombies was born. A brand new take on the core zombies formula, and needless to say, it has split the community right down the middle and in a way that I have never seen before. And while a little division sown inside fans' hearts is nothing new here, here, the fact that MWZ is receiving such praise is both awesome and quite worrying. Because the truth is, this is a really well executed game mode. But like the title of this video says, this could create a major problem and if you have been around long enough then you know exactly why. So why is Modern Warfare Zombies so good? What steps can Treyarch take to make it even better? And most importantly, how are we going to handle these monumental changes as a community while waiting for the traditional round base to return in 2024? Well we have a lot to talk about so let's get our Stack stacked with legendary schematics. This is Modern Warfare Zombies. The launch of a new Call of Duty is always exciting. It doesn't matter if you hate it or love it. It's all anyone and everyone talks about for weeks until the dust finally settles and becomes the normal course of content that we will be playing or not playing for the next year. But when it comes to Zombies, the emotional palette isn't quite the same as the rest of the game's offering because Zombies has a visceral component to it that isn't quite replicable by MP or the campaign. And whenever the Zombies mode launches and it hits just right, it makes those highs feel super high, but when it doesn't bode so well, well, those lows feel about as possibly low as anything else can feel. And right now, the zombies community is so fractured, I don't think anyone knows exactly how to feel about it when it comes to the future of zombies or modern warfare zombies as a whole. Mr. Raffle Waffles, aka Milo, made a video discussing how the zombies community is broken down into multiple groups based on casual versus hardcore fandoms, as well as the round based versus outbreak enjoyers. And I think he summed up the community's feelings rather well, and I would like to continue continue the conversation here just a bit before we dive into the nitty gritty details of the review. First things first, Modern Warfare Zombies is a good mode. It's well done, it's flushed out, it has been developed by Treyarch's AAA main zombies dev team, whatever the hell you want to call them. It has legs, it has longevity, but most importantly there is a large part of the fan base that are receiving it positively, which means that it's splintering fans even more and I think that's a very big problem. But before we had Modern Warfare Zombies, we had Outbreak, which is what sparked 
this whole conversation of what it was to be an open world zombies mode. And the reason that this is all very important to cover is the reaction from the fan base during Outbreak's life cycle, I believe really swayed Treyarch to feel one way or the other about round based versus open world zombies. So before Outbreak even came into existence inside of Black Ops Cold War, we had two very poor round based maps, D Machina and Firebase Z. And when Outbreak finally became available to the public, Treyarch created a blog post breaking down the success of the mode and made a claim that the player base was rivaling Cold War's round based content, splitting fans right down the middle 50 50. Now, while I have no reason to assume that Treyarch lied, I do have a reason to assume that they misread the data or at least presented it to us in a misleading way. Now, whether or not that was intentional or just gross negligence, we can argue about the semantics in the comments. But either way, here is what I really think happened. Both D Machina and Firebase Z were bland and boring maps with lackluster main quests and had been made terribly easy due to the overhaul with gameplay mechanics. Then Outbreak comes along, which is new and exciting, bringing in zombies, multiplayer, and Warzone players, which inflates the numbers. Treyarch also released the blog post shortly after Outbreak's release, which is an unfair comparison of statistics, assuming that they were comparing the round-based numbers during Outbreak's release window as opposed to the release window of the individual maps during their respective launch dates. We also have to remember that this was during COVID when gaming numbers were at an all-time high and inflated through the roof. And this wasn't just with Call of Duty, but with the gaming industry as a whole. So while I do believe that Outbreak was a win for Treyarch at the time, I think the level of interest was largely exaggerated and has inadvertently forced Treyarch to put too many eggs in the Outbreak basket. Now fast forward to Modern Warfare Zombies and we have a whole new open world zombies mode that is more or less Outbreak's evolution. And while there were many naysayers, myself included, who have realized it's not nearly as bad as they thought it would be, there is a new group of dissenting opinions that are absolutely vicious this year. And when you combine this with the fact that it was a vast step up from Vanguard Zombies and is somehow satiating the player base's hunger for anything COD Zombies, one can't help but think this is going to lead to more problems down the road with not only traditional round-based content, but for having a cohesive vision and a unified player base come 2024. But even with all of the people who hate this mode, I'm not sure that their voices are loud enough to dissuade Treyarch from whatever open world zombies plans they have in the future now that MWZ is taking root. While leaks have been sprouting out about round-based coming to Modern Warfare 3, as well as brand new maps and features coming to COD 2024, the truth of the matter is, we really just have no idea what the hell is going to happen, which is why the title of this video is so important. If the success is misread, then who knows what Treyarch's going to do? And while we obviously want zombies to take risks, and for things to move forward, there is a feeling of abandonment of the core DNA that COD Zombies brought to the table, and that, in my opinion, is quite worrying. So does this mean you should play Modern Warfare Zombies? I think the short answer is yes, I do recommend it. $70 is certainly expensive, and if you are uncertain about dropping that amount of coin to play a side mode, that's totally fair, and I understand and empathize with that. But acting like a little snot who hasn't even played the game and making full-blown opinions on it, well that ain't it chief. I understand more than anyone that games are expensive these days, and with the way COD latches onto their live service models, SBMM, and their modernized zombies offering, it's no wonder that people are hesitant. And then when you tack on that there are performance issues to boot, it can make any impatient player not want to wait around for patches to fix what should have already been fixed from the get-go. So hopefully this video helps you make your decision in the end, and with that said, let's dive a little deeper. What the hell is this mode all about? How does it work? What is the goal here? Well, in simplest terms, Modern Warfare Zombies is an extraction shooter with various levels of difficulty sectioned throughout the map, where you spawn in with a particular loadout, find tons of loot throughout your playthrough, and leave more powerful than you started. However, while you're playing, there is a 45 minute timer ticking on the right hand side of your screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just come to my attention that I have made a mistake by saying that the timer is on the right hand side of the screen when it is indeed on the left hand side of the screen. I apologize for this error. I apologize to anyone I may have hurt, my friends, my family, my coworkers, and most importantly, hold on one sec. I'm getting something. Hold on one second. Yeah, no, 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 no. No, you don't have to do that. No, it's fine. You, you just, no, 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 please, please don't, don't, don't. I don't really know what any of that was. Let's just, uh, 
get back to it. And once the clock strikes zero, a dark ether storm will begin moving and spreading all over the map for the next 15 minutes, which buffs zombies, prevents exfilling, and will eventually kill all players. So it is imperative to exfil before the entire 60 minute clock runs out or before the storm sweeps over an exfil location. It is quite different from traditional round based where the goal is to become fully set up and push through never ending rounds until you become bored or eventually die. And even though on paper it appears that these two takes on zombies are vastly different, occasionally there is a bit of overlap that makes it feel like COD zombies in the overarching gameplay loop. But rather than that feeling being constant like in a map such as Dorizendrac, it's much more spaced out and uneven, having the player occasionally enter pockets of chaos that bring about the tension of that round based experience. Throughout the play session, you will explore the map completing contracts, taking down enemy camps, nests, and strongholds, as well as pushing from the easiest threat zone to the hardest threat zone to up the risk so that you can acquire more worthwhile rewards. No matter what you do in Modern Warfare Zombies, you will be gathering points and some way, shape, or form. Killing zombies only gives you around 20 points per kill, while contracts will reward you anywhere between 2,000 to 5,000 points, depending on the threat level zone in which you are completing the activated contract in. There are also story missions that the player can complete, which are challenges that range from an easy to a medium difficulty and help lead the player to the end of an act which has an enemy rush or a boss fight encounter. A lot of people are going to spam in the comment section that this mode is very similar to DMZ from Modern Warfare 2 and I honestly felt the same before launch as well. And while there are many overlaps here when it comes to the DMZ gameplay, like I mentioned previously, there are more moments that I feel are kind of like zombies, and it happens way more than you would expect. You're just going to have to take my word on it or experience it for yourself. But the missions, the enemies, the perks, the weapon upgrade system, and the overall gameplay loop really don't remind me of DMZ that much other than maybe the concept of completing contracts, the enemy AI, and of course the X filling. But the thing is, you spawn in the mode less powerful than you do at the end. If you die, you lose everything. You need to acquire points to grow stronger and upgrade your loot. These are all concepts and features that are inside of round based zombies. It's just framed or packaged differently. But even though there are similarities to the round based gameplay loop, there are mechanics inside of MWZ that severely restrict the player and enjoyment of the mode as well, which creates a dichotomy that is part of this fan base polarization. If you have ever seen any of my BO4 retrospectives here on the channel, then you likely know how important art direction and world building is to zombies from my personal point of view. As when we look back on various maps from over the years, we can see just how unique and special some of those locations are. Whether it's Darius from World at War or Ancient Evil in Black Ops 4, there is something special or magical about heading to unknown territory and discovering all of the secrets underneath the map's surface. And well, Urzikstan, the Warzone map, which hosts MWZ, it's just not very interesting. There are unique points of interest peppered throughout the map, and the layout is definitely easy to learn and to navigate, but the structures that make up the world are all truly just copy and pasted from one another. Sure, there are buildings in smaller locations that aren't exactly a one-to-one -one replica, but it's close enough to where you feel this sense of deja vu as you really kind of have been to most of the buildings before in some way, shape, or form. And while this isn't a bad thing in terms of designing a large map that's meant to be multiplayer or war zone friendly, it is really disheartening when it comes to zombies because this has been a constant issue since the downfall of Black Ops 4 and when Jason Blundell left Treyarch. Maps like D Machina, Firebase Z, The Forsaken, all of the Outbreak maps, and nearly everything inside of Vanguard Zombies have been nothing short of soulless when you compare them to the iconic locations that our zombies crews have visited over the years. And Urzikstan follows that same pattern of soulless map design meant to really pad out the large space rather than taking smaller locations and make them feel dense and packed with content. And I will say that the cutscenes in this game are genuinely beautiful, like top tier AAA cinematic content, but I just don't feel like they fit inside of the COD Zombies ethos. Everything just feels like I'm watching or participating in some boring Modern Warfare multiplayer battle pass trailer rather than some magical cutscenes of the past inside of BO2, 3, and 4. But even though the cutscenes are nice to look at, unfortunately the narrative of which they espouse is bottom of the barrel. This seems to 
to be taking place inside of the Dark Aether universe that Cold War Zombies had established in late 2020. But now, instead of our characters existing in the 1980s, we are a modern military crew under the guise of Operation Deadbolt living in 2021, trying to stop Zakaev and his crew of bad guys called Terminus Outcomes. Zakaev has discovered a secret stash of Ethereum and brought along his crew to gather it. And during this operation, he was ambushed by the military police, which he needed to curate a defense for. So in order to secure his escape, he threw one of the vials into the crowd, which unleashed this awful dark ether madness in Urzikstan, turning everyone into zombies. While Zakaev was on his mission, he stumbled across the dead bodies of Weaver and other characters from Black Ops Cold War, but we don't know exactly what's going on with them yet, just that our storyline in this game is focusing on the current events of stopping Terminus outcomes. The story in MWZ is divided into three acts, which are broken into story missions, all equipped with their own final missions or boss encounters if you will, and have their own ending cutscenes. The overarching premise of MWZ has Operation Deadbolt, aka the good guys, securing Dr. Jensen, who is a scientist that worked for Zakaev to study Ethereum. However, it was too late for her once she realized that he was a terrorist and that she was helping a madman create one of the most powerful weapons in the world. After arresting Dr. Jensen, we realized that she was telling the truth by stating she was unaware of Zakaev being a wanted terrorist, but now wants to help bring him down as she is one of the only people in the world who can stop him since she knows the chemical makeup of Ethereum inside and out. The rest of the story is simply Operation Deadbolt coming up with ways to stop Zakaev unleashing a dark ether dirty bomb, using Ethereum neutralizers, and collecting research from other scientists. Now, I won't continue here for the sake of spoilers if you're interested, but we will be talking about the story later in the video since aspects of the gameplay and the story are correlated together. Overall, this story is one of the most boring and poorly written pieces that Treyarch has come out with in a long time. All of the characters are random, they are forced into the timeline with no introduction as to who, what, or why they are important in the first place. It literally feels like we are walking into a situation we know nothing about with people we don't know and are playing catch up with what is going on at any given moment. Luckily, the story is so boring and cliche, it doesn't take a genius to understand the subpar plot lines, but I would be lying if I said that this didn't concern me for the future Zombies games as they hinge on great storytelling. Usually there is a line between great games gameplay, beautiful map design, and that fantastical storytelling we know and love, and it's up to Treyarch to make sure that they get the balance just right. When one of these elements is severely out of tune, then the other areas suffer because of it, or they have to overcompensate to make up for the lack of originality and good writing. Similar to what Cold War Zombies did with its story and over-reliance on gameplay mechanics. And while I doubt anything is going to drastically change or pick up here since the Modern Warfare universe is about as interesting as a wet paper towel, I just hope that Craig Houston is cooking up something amazing for Black Ops 6 in 2024, because unfortunately, this just isn't working. The biggest part about Modern Warfare Zombies is getting used to the structure of how the game mode works. Because while most fans are used to setting up in a zombies game with your perks, pack-a-punch, and wonder weapons to then survive for as long as you can, this mode kind of changes that formula by having you reset every hour more or less. The goal here is to infill into the map, survive for about an hour while looting up as much great gear as you can, and then exfilling. If you die during the playthrough, you will lose everything you acquired on that run and will have to start over, building your operator up again to the point where you are happy with it. Initially, this tends to feel very punishing while you're learning and getting the hang of things. I mean, I personally remember at the beginning, I just felt like I was treading water constantly, like I just couldn't push through the first zone. But the more you play it, you start to understand that X-filling is similar to a checkpoint system where you are able to save your progress and then push in deeper to the map's higher threat zones. So the first thing we need to discuss is how the mode is designed around being in a squad of three people in terms of both difficulty, scale of the map, Map, as well as the time limit. And when players are hopping in for the first time, it can seem a bit daunting. There are at any point in time up to 24 players on the map in a maximum of eight squads of three. And if any squad at any time is so inclined, they can pair up with other players or squads and join up to take down zombies together, which breaks down into four teams of six players each at the maximum. There is just so much content to dive into and you don't always know where to begin when combined with the initial difficulty curve and learning how to deal with other players. It really 
will take a few games or maybe even a few days to get used to all of the new systems at play. Now, the big complaint I think most people will have with this mode is that it isn't solo friendly, or at least that's the picture that is being painted right now. But honestly, I just have to disagree with that. While it is more difficult than playing on a squad, it is super doable and I would argue a lot more fun and rewarding once you get the hang of it. So you will 100% have to be set up to push into tier two or to tier three, that high threat zone. But once you get in there, surviving is super, super fun. And the loot rewards are much more worth your time. Grabbing a bounty contract and pushing on a mega abomination and earning things like the ray gun schematic or just any wonder weapon in general, as well as getting more perks, tons of schematics and high tier ether crystals. It's just super great. And I highly recommend it. It's a very big thrill. But if you're having trouble pushing into that high threat zone, there are tricks you can do to get more points passively. A way I recommend is just joining other squads and then wandering off and just doing your own thing. And while they're out there completing contracts, you'll be getting all of their points, their power ups, their random perks if they happen to pick up any. And then you can earn points by completing your own contracts and raiding nests and just keeping all of those great rewards while they're away from you. So you get a solo experience, but you get to reap all the rewards from co-op. Not to mention, they will know if you go down and will likely revive you since you are on their team. This is a great way to dip your toes into the mode by being showered with points and experimenting by purchasing things and getting overpowered early so that you don't go down right away from that lack of experience. But what's ironic about this mode's poor excuse for a story and its uninspired art direction is that due to the sheer amount of players and action occurring in the map, things feel so alive. There is never a dull moment thanks to the way that zombies spawn and track you. Players are constantly hovering around. There's contracts, side missions, story missions. There's just always something to do and look forward to while keeping the player on the edge of their seat. And this is quite an accomplishment as Outbreak was never quite able to realize the potential of an open world zombies experience. So how does it all work? So just like every zombies mode over the course of time, the game starts in the menu. This is where you select your weapon and your gear loadout, as well as which act mission you'd like to focus on in your game. If we first hop over to the strike team menu, we can see that there is an option to choose from three operators. Now, these operators should be thought of as three different characters with their own unique sets of gear, but all dipping into the same loadout pool. So for example, you can see here that my ghost zombie operator has no gear on him, but my spec grew operator, or however you say that word, has a large rucksack and score streak, a three plate armor vest, gas mask, and a self revive kit. These elements are non-transferable between your operator classes, but the general loot pool is. And if we head over to the gear menu, you can see the ghost operator has certain loot in his default small rucksack. And if we compare that to spec grew, it's the same exact loadout, except I can hold more items due to having a larger backpack on that operator. However, if I go down in match and I die while playing as the spec grew operator, I will lose all of my gear and loot and will be in the exact same position as the ghost operator. And if I go in as ghost and I get a medium rucksack and a legendary gas mask and I come back out, I will have a different gear set compared to spec group. This allows you to switch between your operators in case you die and lose all your stuff so you don't have to completely start from scratch every single match, which can become frustrating after a little while. Now regarding the gear or loot that you can bring with you, this is able to be utilized in the match at any point in time. You're also able able to find better loot during your playthrough by completing contracts, killing boss enemies, and raiding enemy encampments. The amount of loot you can carry on your operator is largely based on the size of your rucksack, and when you're in the main menu deciding what you want to carry with you or what you want to leave behind, there is a stash tab and a schematics tab so that you can store and create things in case you didn't find what you wanted during your match. If we take a look at the acquisition stash tab first, you can see there are a variety of items stored in there and you are able to store more items inside of it, swap gear around, as well well as store your schematics in there for safekeeping until you're ready to use them in the future. There is also a rewards tab, which is where acquisition rewards are stored from completing story missions throughout the various acts in Modern Warfare Zombies. You are able to see all of the rewards you will unlock or have unlocked by hovering over the story mission in the story missions tab. The schematics tab has four sub tabs where you can craft specific acquisitions that you can bring with you into a match. So far we have Ethereum, Perca-Colas, Ammo Mods, and the Wonder Weapon 
weapons tab. The way that this works is during MWZ, while you are completing missions and contracts, you will come across schematics so that you can craft any one of those following items. And this is a permanent unlock that is on a cooldown. So once you find these plans, you can craft the items as many times as you want, but the cooldown associated with them is based off of the rarity or significance of the item. For example, perks will have about a three hour cooldown, whereas wonder weapons will have a 48 hour cooldown. This prevents players from being able to abuse the system, but there is a bit of a flaw here, which we will touch on in just a moment. Under the Ethereum tab, we are able to craft weapon related schematics that will buff our weapon rarity with ether tools, which are a return from Black Ops Cold War, as well as create pack-a-punch Ethereum crystals that buff your weapon up to either tier one or tier two of the game's weapon upgrade system. The Perkacolas tab and the Ammo Mods tab are pretty self-explanatory, which allow you to create whichever perks or ammo mods that you want. And then finally, the Wonder Weapons tab hosts the Ray Gun and the Wonder Waffa DG2 to craft and place into your loadout inside of MWZ. Now, a lot of people claim that this is antithetical to the core COD Zombies formula of spawning in with nothing and surviving for as long as you can. And that is true. But the rules are different here in MWZ, so you can't go into the game with that same thought process. In round-based zombies, if you upgrade your weapons and get all of your perks, the end goal is to survive for as long as you can. Whereas in MWZ, you are gearing up to be able to push in further, acquire better loot, and then restarting, picking up where you left off and pushing even farther than the previous time. And then you just rinse and repeat that process. So the great thing about the systems in MWZ is that it allows you to spawn into Urzikstan, slam down a couple of perks, craft a ray gun, pack a punch it, and push all the way into the red zone to take down some mega boss zombies, secure better loot so that you have future options to not spend your time completing those same easy contracts and getting set up over and over again. Now, if you want, you can start from scratch every single game and avoid this entire new system. But I highly recommend trying things out the way that Treyarch designed them because the biggest thing inhibiting most old school zombies fans is the fact that they are treating this like a round based map. The last thing here in the menu system is the basic aspect of your loadout where you just select your weapons, tactical, lethal, and your field upgrade equipment. And over time, the player will unlock the ability to have three insured weapon slots that let you spawn in with any gun that you want. However, if you exfil with, let's say, a random pistol that you found, that will deposit into your contraband stash, which is there to counter your insured stash in case you die inside of MWZ. If the player decides to take one of their insured weapons and unfortunately doesn't make it out alive, the weapon slot will go on a cooldown for a few hours, and then you can either choose to take one of your contraband weapons, use another insured weapon slot if you have one, or you can go in with nothing and hope for the best. Really don't recommend that, but hey, you do you. As far as the tactical and lethals go, it's all content that we have seen before. Things like decoy grenades, stim shots, grenades, and molotovs, it's it's all here. Energy mine, frenzied guard, healing aura, frost blast, ether shroud, the Tesla storm, they're all back as field upgrades. And to be honest, they are quite a disappointment compared to the field upgrades inside of Cold War and quite a downgrade compared to the specialists in either BO3 or 4, but we will talk about that when we get into the combat section of this video. But what's great about this entire menu system and having this much control over your loadout is that it will always be getting tweaked and upgraded over time by Treyarch. Things like new wonder weapons, field upgrades, and schematics are more than likely going to be brought into the fold, which will only increase the replayability of this mode for the foreseeable future. We already know that the VR11 is going to be added in during Season 1, and therefore, likely going to become a schematic that can be unlocked via seasonal challenges, which is a really good sign that they are planning updates soon after launch. There really is only one main problem with Treyarch's system here, and that's maintaining all rewards via exfil. You see, when you exfil, you keep things like perk cans or ether tools, but what you don't keep are things like wonder weapons or the rarity and pack-a-punch level of your weapon you were holding at the time. For example, if a player were to survive for 50 minutes in the high threat zone, have the ray gun and an insured weapon fully packed to tier 3 and somehow manages to get out safely, the player doesn't keep any of that weapon rarity, the PAP tier, or the wonder weapon inside of the loadout. It's essentially all stripped away and you can only keep items like perks, ether crystals, ether tools, etc. So while it seems like a great idea to have a 48 hour cooldown on your ray gun that you just crafted, I honestly don't see the point in crafting it at all if you're just going to use it in one singular game that's approximately 45 minutes in duration. What should happen is that Treyarch should tie this system to the life 
life of whichever operator that you played with. So if you spawned or found a ray gun, you can keep using that weapon until you die or lose it. And if you want to take bigger risks because you have a better weapon to do so, that is 100% on you. It does seem like the devs will be making adjustments over time, whether it's to the 60 minute timer or the exfil reward system. But for now, there are some glaring issues that take out the OP fun we could be having. Because remember guys, at the end of the day, this is just a PVE mode and there is no reason to worry about being super overpowered at times as long as you have to do the work to get there. So now that we understand the basics, let's talk about what a standard match of Modern Warfare Zombies looks like. After selecting your gear, the player will load into a match and be able to open their rucksack and equip either everything or nothing that they have stowed on them at the time, kind of like what we talked about earlier. And this is when the player will open up their map to see what contracts and missions are around them so that they can begin their excursion. If you've come into the match stacked with perks and wonder weapons, this will indicate which threat zone you want to begin tackling first. Tier 1 is a basic threat level where the zombies are pretty relaxed and it's much much easier to survive and complete challenges. Tier 2 is a medium threat level where the zombies are a little more challenging and admittedly at first, Tier 2 was surprisingly tricky to get used to. The enemies are much tankier, they're much faster and more deadly, but if you continue to push through and keep practicing, it's not nearly as bad as it seems up front. Tier 3 is where shit really hits the fan. According to the developers, this is equivalent to about round 50, 55 in regular zombies and it certainly does feel like it. The thing about each of these tiers is that there isn't a difficulty creep or a power creep from the enemies that slowly builds up over time. It's very jarring steps moving from tier one to tier two and then to eventually tier three. You can really feel the difficulty spike. And if the player isn't prepped or ready, they will definitely get screwed over and be dependent on other players to survive, get revived just to get out of there and keep their stuff. Now, the biggest thing here, in my opinion, is the timer. A lot of people are dogging on the timer. They don't like that there's only 45 minutes plus the 15 minutes to avoid the storm. And I completely agree. It is a nuisance and it needs to be extended by at least half. Go in there with an hour and a half to play. There is just not enough time to get set up and just enjoy the experience of Modern Warfare Zombies. By the time you're fully set up and pushing into the third zone, you're already ready to go, or at least it's about time to get ready to think about leaving. And then if you screw things up inside of the storm, you basically lose everything that you worked for. And it's just not a very enjoyable system. So I really hope that Treyarch is listening here and extends that timer by at least 30 minutes, if not double it, just so that you can play around, have a good time, grind camos, do whatever the hell you want. It's very restrictive to have something inhibiting you from being able to just play the mode as is. Right now, it feels like the only thing to do is to just get set up. So it's really pertinent that you save your high tier loot so that you can constantly push into the higher threat areas. Now, inside each tier are roughly the same types of contracts and enemies with the exception of tier three. And obviously, if you are to go ahead and complete contracts and the much more more difficult tiers, that means things are going to be much more hard, but you're going to get better rewards. The contracts that we have available to us as of now are the Bounty Hunter contract, which has you find a boss zombie on the map and kill it. The Outlast contract, which is a defense holdout mission, which is located in a random building covered in ether crystals. This is the most reminiscent of the round based experience. We have the Weapon Raid, which is a defense holdout where you have to open up an enemy cache and prevent zombies from killing you. We have the Ether Extractor mission, which which is destroying three ether extractor machines while soldiers from Terminus Outcomes attack you. The escort contract, which is an escort mission of following a dead bolt rover and preventing zombies from destroying it. Cargo delivery, driving a vehicle and delivering contents to your pilot. A spore control contract, which is destroying six large dark ether spores. And lastly, we have the ground station defense contract, which has you activate three machines that dig into the ground and defend a computer from enemy soldiers of Terminus Outcomes. After any contract is successfully completed, a dark Dark Ether Portal will spawn, gifting the player various rewards, which can be things like perks, weapons, ether tools, ether crystals, equipment, etc, etc. The player can either choose to hold on to said reward in their rucksack, exfil and use it later, or they can use it at that current moment in time and push further into the map into the pursuit of even better rewards. And a small little detail here that Treyarch added when you're completing your contracts is that zombies just don't disappear. Yes, they initially get obliterated, but then other zombies will trickle in and continue to attack you before you 
can grab all of your supplies. And this is just a nice little testament on how to keep things feeling fluid and alive rather than segmented by objectives and POIs. But even outside the general contracts, there is even more to do that just keeps player engagement super high. Infected nests and strongholds where gross zombies are located that are packed with boss zombies, regular zombies, and crawlers with these spores and boils everywhere. It's just so disgusting. And once this is complete, you will be able to loot the entire premises and get some really great gear similar to what you generally get from completing contracts and killing boss zombies. But I find it to be much more consistent and reliable. Plus, clearing out these nests, it's just super fun and it kind of reminds me of round based a bit where it gets very tense in a tiny, tight location. Definitely a highlight in my personal opinion. There's also all of the mercenary objectives. We have the camp, the stronghold, and the fortress, which are just three camps that scale from easy to hard difficulty in terms of dealing with the enemy AI. And while I don't mind completing these encampments from time to time, the rewards aren't as great unless you pursue the safes inside of the strongholds. However, you can't access them unless you acquire a mercenary stronghold key card, which can only be found in the mercenary camp. We also have the harvester orbs, which they make a return from outbreak as well, where shooting these will drop points in a few common to rare items. And lastly, we have the Aether Storm's Stormcaller. So inside of the Dark Aether Storm, there is a special disciple boss called the Stormcaller, and you will come up against him in a mainline story objective. And it's a fun little challenge to do every now and again, but I have noticed that loot he drops is very hit or miss in terms of quality. I did get a golden skull, I think one time, but most of the time I just kind of get junk. So it really just all depends. Now, ironically enough, there are side Easter eggs in MWZ, which I was pretty surprised about. I figured there might be a couple winks and nods to some story things from Cold War, but there is a good amount of side content to pursue if you are looking for it. There is a small Easter egg to unlock for every single perk in the game for free, and you can even take it with you out of the match so you don't have to waste it in game. And in case you haven't seen all of the videos all over YouTube or the Mr. Peaks bunny rabbits lying all over the map, these are the indicators for whichever perk Easter egg you would like to complete. And most interestingly enough, the side Easter egg for Elemental Pop allows the player to strip their weapon of all of their upgrades and take them out of the match, which will then secure your power level for the next game. This does help to alleviate the issue I have with not being able to leave with your pack-a-punched weapons, but it still doesn't allow you to take your wonder weapons with you and reuse them for the next match. Progress, not perfection, I suppose. But for this one, all you need to do is go to this grave in the high threat zone and interact with it, and an ether reward portal will spawn in, allowing you to access your items. Now, it doesn't always work 100% of the time, so just be cautious whenever you're interacting interacting with this grave. I've also seen that there are some cool side missions where there's a bunker you can unlock, and overall there is a surprising amount of depth to this mode, and I think the main reason this is getting overlooked and lambasted by a portion of the community is simply because it's just spelled out for players. Whether it's these easy side easter eggs or straight up contracts that point you to a map marker, it's really not the same as discovering things yourself with no indication of where to go next. That magic that COD Zombies possesses isn't entirely missing here in MWZ, but it's not present like most players are used to, and unfortunately, it doesn't stop here. Earlier, we were going over the main storyline in MWZ and how terrible it was, and of course, all of that still stands true, but the missions surrounding the story, on the other hand, are a little bit all over the place. All individual challenges leading up to the final story mission of each act are a mix between those tutorial-style missions where developers try to trick you into thinking you're playing the game, but you're really just learning how the game works, and then actual missions that are fun with good gameplay and decent rewards. But at the very end of the challenge log, you'll notice a final story mission, which is more or less a boss fight type situation that is followed up by a story cutscene and the ability to progress to the next act. These final story missions will be permanent fixtures on the MWZ map, which means that at any time during your excursion, instead of completing a proper exfil, you can jump into another 45 minutes of gameplay and participate in one of the three story endings, which to be honest is pretty great. So let's quickly break down how each one of these final encounters works so you get an idea of what you're going up against. Story mission number one has the player pushing through loads of undead and enemy AI to finally meet Dr. Jensen for the first time. This is followed up by a holdout mission where more enemies flood the halls while Dr. Jensen finishes gathering her data from a computer. And once she's finished, players will move towards the roof, killing enemies along the way until we exfil to safety and are greeted with this cutscene. Is all this cloak and dagger stuff necessary? I'm the one who called you, remember? I'm not the one that needs convincing. Keep walking. Welcome to Operation Deadbolt. The boss would like a word with you. 
you. The company hired me to continue my research on energy production from n-dimensional interactions. It was purely theoretical. Right up until it wasn't. As for Zakayev, I had no idea I was working for a terrorist. You're lying. I thought he was the CEO. I'm a physicist, not a mind reader. And I wouldn't have had to work for him or anyone if you assholes hadn't shut me down. Zakayev is still out there with even more weapons grade Ethereum, but I happen to know he keeps it on his person at all times. Why would I tell you that if I didn't want him stopped? Look. I know this element down to its protons. I'm fairly certain I can find a way to neutralize it. Fairly certain won't cut it. Can you do it or no? Perhaps we should hear her out. Please. I have to fix this. I may be the only person who can. You better be right. Direction's going great. Gonna make a killing selling this Ethereum. When I've enriched enough to make more of these, you can do as you please with the rest. And what about our runner? Hmm? She's played her part. Find her and kill her. The player now knows that we have to work with Dr. Jensen in order to stop Zakaya from spreading his Dark Aether weapon to destroy the world since she is the only one capable of doing so. And in order to execute their mission properly, Operation Deadbolt needs to build an Ethereum neutralizer to destroy the Ethereum out in the field. But before we are able to escort the machine, the player must push through tons of zombies and Terminus Outcomes enemy soldiers in a pretty fun holdout mission where you secure resources and prepare for the next levels of engagement. Once complete, Operation Deadbolt drops the Ethereum neutralizing rover down near our location to escort through fields of Ethereum crystals and enemies. This is hands down one of the best missions as you are escorting this huge rover, killing zombies and AI soldiers, and there are tons of tense moments. And finally, at the end is a large mega abomination who absolutely annihilates everyone and everything in its path. Truly great stuff. As you can see, the test was a success. The ether neutralizer destabilizes any ethereum within its blast radius. What remains of the element rapidly decays into harmless isotopes. But that was raw, unprocessed ethereum. The material in Zakayev's vial is highly enriched. My projections show this weapons grade ethereum can withstand our prototype. In other words, you failed. This was a waste of time and resources. Not true. The principle has been proven. We just need to amplify the neutralizer and recalibrate its output. And you can do that, can you? Not quite. But Zakayev obtained research written by the expert on Ethereum enrichment. Strauss. Old mate of yours? Friends are a luxury I can seldom afford. Zakayev stored Strauss's research in a vault. It'll be heavily guarded, but that research holds the key to upgrading the neutralizer. We don't have time for this. Our focus should be Zakayev himself. And if we find him, then what? He unleashes his remaining vial and we have nothing to counter it. Deadbolt might be able to hammer this thing hard enough to contain him. But if the objective is to end it, that neutralizes our best shot. Fine. Get Strauss's data. See what Dr. Jansen can do with it.
Once the mission completes, Dr. Jensen explains that even with the success of this Ethereum neutralizer, we still wouldn't be able to stop Zakayev due to the purity levels of this Ethereum in his possession. And in order to take him down properly, Dr. Jensen requires us to find old scientific data from an old friend from Black Ops Cold War, Dr. Strauss. After acquiring Dr. Strauss's research, the player heads to Zakayev's facility in order to destroy his Ethereum enrichment devices with explosives. Once this part of the mission is complete, we head to a nearby landing zone to activate our enhanced Ethereum neutralizer to destroy all Ethereum in the area so that Zakayev can no longer replicate his vial in a lab to recreate the outbreak and other weapons of destruction as well. But of course, nothing goes to plan and as the neutralizer begins to charge, a giant creature explodes from underneath the ground and it's up to Operation Deadbolt to protect the machine, stop Zakaya from leaving, destroy all the Ethereum, as well as take down Orcus. Words can't express how excited I was to take down this creature before the launch of Modern Warfare 3. And I have to be completely honest with you, the Orcus boss fight was quite the disappointment. Before we talk about the encounter itself, I want to discuss again how shoehorned all of this felt. There was never a narrative moment that was preparing us for the danger ahead. There wasn't any mystery. There was never any character that said, you know, I've heard Zakayev is working on creating monsters. And then a soldier replies, well, all of that's just rumors for now, but we have to keep cautious because anything can happen out there. There was literally nothing. Treyarch could have even used one of the contracts where we defend the machines that measure the seismic activity to talk about wild readings and something lurking under the ground that our scientists have never seen before. But instead, the boss is just plastered onto the menu waiting for us to fight it. Just another item on the to-do list that we need to tick off. This stuff just drives me crazy and it's such bad storytelling and that's how this whole storyline is presented. As for the fight itself, it was just as disappointing if not worse than the tension and the buildup. Never at any point did I feel threatened or worried for my safety. I had plenty of armor plates, plenty of ammo, not to mention there are ammo refill stations and buy stations everywhere to make sure that you're stocked up at any given moment. The one thing I was initially concerned about on my first playthrough was the number of zombies that would spawn in, but they barely ever showed up, meaning that I could just sit around and focus on Orcus for as long as I needed. Orcus's attack regimen isn't really difficult to evade either. He has a few different attacks. One is a laser beam that shoots from his mouth. There is an underground attack where he will attack you, pushing you into the sky, making you float down on your parachute. He also has a slam attack and he shoots out those swarms that are similar to Orda inside of Outbreak. Now, don't get me wrong. The concept of Orcus and the attacks that he does are super cool and it's really badass and it's a great looking boss, but it was not intimidating in the slightest. I was super excited to try the Wonder Waff and the Ray Gun inside of the boss fight just in case things got out of control. And to be quite frank, Wonder Weapons aren't really useful in this situation at all, at least not on the boss. And since there were no zombies spawning in, I really had no reason to use them for crowd control. But after all of the disappointment finally comes to an end and Orcus is taken down, the final cutscene begins to play where we see what appears to be a familiar face. <laughs>
Take him to the brig. Green will get the interrogation started. They nice sign of Zakayev. He may be bloodied, but he's still breathing. Next time he sticks his head up, I'll take it off. What about the neutralizer? Dobbs, what's the sea trip? Give me some good news. Mm, negative. Good initial clear on detonation, but dark ether contacts are repopulating. Also picking up an energy spike in the red zone. Never seen anything <laughs> like it. Well, looks like this shit show just keeps getting better and better. Everyone on TP! Looks like this off isn't gonna be over anytime soon. Bang, grab enough. Ready for evac. Guard copy. Stand by, ETA two minutes. Earlier inside of mission number two's cutscene, it appeared that Dr. Jensen was experiencing headaches that were of concern to Ravanov, which she assured us was nothing. But as 150 IQ audience members, we all knew that likely something had to be going on with the Dark Aether, as she had been working closely with it for God knows how long. So while the Dark Aether orb was opening up and inhaling everything in its path, Dr. Jensen was gently lifted up, greeted by who we assumed to be Samantha Maxis, and imbued with Dark Aether energy. Obviously, we don't know what's happening with her power powers at this current point in time, and will likely know more in future seasons, but even with that said, I have to stress that this was one of the most boring and generic bosses and storylines I have ever experienced. No one cares about these characters, they have nothing to do with anything, and the Dark Aether story is boring as hell. There are no stakes, nothing has any meaning, it's all filler, it's all nonsense. While we have no reason to think that this story is going to get any better, hopefully Treyarch steps it up and injects more storyline missions and boss fights through Modern Warfare Zombies. In fact, I'm almost certain that they will. But after this showing, I would rather have them focus on creating better and more difficult boss encounters similar to Valentina in Mauer or Legion inside of Outbreak, or really just copy any of the bosses from Infinite Warfare. Because everything that's going on with the story just is not interesting at all, so let's just focus on the gameplay, and maybe in 2024, we'll have a narrative to actually care about. I am not really sure what happened during the days of Black Ops Cold War, but something flipped at Treyarch where the gameplay became the sole focus and star of the show. And for the most part, that is a good thing, I think. However, at this point in time, it's really the only redeeming quality in this new era of COD Zombies, which is a shame since the mode used to shine in all areas across the board. And while we're not going to sit here and nitpick between round-based and modern warfare zombies, we'll save that for another video. Just like in Cold War Zombies, the simple act of killing zombies feels great. Shooting the guns feels great. Using the wonder weapons, you guessed it, they all feel great to use. The overall gameplay loop in MWZ is super satisfying as you're crawling up the progression ladder via contracts and other various missions. The crunchy, crispy sounds of shooting zombies in the head and their armor falling off is absolutely superb, and I could literally shoot zombies for hours without a care in the world. Except for the timer, obviously. And as usual, there are the meta weapons. Things like shotguns, LMGs, and ARs are of course some of the best weapons out there, but the battle rifles and SMGs are proving to be useful this year as well. Now, I personally haven't dived into the sniper rifle class or the melee weapons, but I'm sure they are going to make life in Urzikstan pretty damn difficult considering how hostile zombies can be in this fictional wasteland. As per usual, the weapon rarity here is very important and acts as a substitute for Double Tap 2.0. Going deep into the high threat zone with a rare or blue weapon against any enemy will have you being able to kill them, but it will take a very long time, and that's really the overarching issue here is that it just takes way too long for any of your weapons to become lethal at that low of a rarity. But as soon as you upgrade your weapon to epic or legendary, especially when it's back a punch, you will be chewing through enemies like they are nothing. While I was worrying a bit about wonder weapons before launch, they honestly have done such a great job at making sure they all feel impactful and most of all useful. The new wonder weapon, the Scorcher, is surprisingly better than I thought it would be. It's not my favorite by any means, but the charge shot is great as it will blast a whole horde of enemies enemies out of existence, and there is a lingering effect that allows you to train zombies through it, killing them up to a few seconds afterwards. Scorcher also has an ability to shoot the player up into the air and parachute around, which is fantastic for mobility and getting from point A to point B, and it has no cooldown, which is a godsend. Also, the blast when you fire up into the air will kill enemies in your immediate area so that you can fly up away safely and not get hit with that one last swipe and down in the sky. Wonderwaf DG2 is fantastic as well. It is great for taking out hordes of zombies, especially in the high threat zone. However, there are two things about it that I'm not really a fan of. The reload speed is super slow, and it doesn't seem to do very well on larger enemies due to the magazine capacity, the ammo type, and the reload animation. I can't quite
quite put my finger on it, but when I use it against bosses, it just feels bad. The ray gun really takes the cake here. It's the best all around wonder weapon inside of MWZ. It has splash damage. It has auto fire. It has all the things you know and love about it. It's really just great in every situation. And while it wasn't great against the actual Orcus boss fight, if you need it for anything else, it will work perfectly. And while I of course want new and interesting weapons inside of COD Zombies, there's just something truly great about the ray gun here that absolutely fits with what Treyarch is trying to do, and so you just gotta give praise where praise is due. Earlier I briefly touched on the field upgrades and how I wasn't really impressed with the power that they were bringing to the table. In Cold War they were much more useful and simply fun just because we had the ability to upgrade them with the Ether Crystal system, and that added a ton of new features. And just like the perks that we will talk about in a moment, the field upgrades are limited to just one main ability and only one main activation. They definitely don't feel like that get out of jail free card like they did in Cold War, where for example you were able to use your Frost Blast charge up to three times in succession and in MWZ it's only usable once per charge. Personally, I think the best field upgrade by far is Tesla Storm due to the fact that it lasts the longest and pushes damage onto the zombies while you can shoot them and it will hold them in place. It also works very well with other players even if they don't have the field upgrade on them it will actually tag them creating a large Tesla Storm, obviously that's what it does. Frost Blast is also decent as well as Frenzied Guard, and surprisingly enough, Energy Mine got a little bit of a buff, making it a little more powerful and viable than it was in Cold War, which is great, other than the actual number of uses you can activate it. But unfortunately, the main issue here with the field upgrades is that you simply spawn in the game with them, and discovering the specialist weapon Easter Eggs in BO3 was so much fun and rewarding. It's really a damn shame that this is where we're at, and even as a hardcore BO4 shill, I recognize that that was the game where specialists spawned on the character and I really did not like that. So I really hope that they add in new field upgrades over time because right now using these same ones from Cold War just isn't very exciting, especially since they have been toned back a bit. They're all kind of mid, but they get the job done for whatever it's worth. And now the perk system in this game has had a bit of a refresh as well and it's more akin to something like Black Ops 3 where there was just one effect more or less per perk. There is no modifier when all the perks are active and there is no RPG ether or crystal system that is used to upgrade your perks to various tiers inside of the game's menu. And most importantly, all of the perks are very necessary here. They are much more important I feel like they were in previous games, as I have completed many easter eggs without any perks in Cold War, without any perks in Black Ops 3, Black Ops 4, but in this game, you can't get away with not having perks. You need them at all times. Now you can get away with only having a few, but at the very least you need things like Stamina Up, Speed Cola, and Juggernog. Perks like Deadshot, and death perception, they also help with critical damage and identifying things on the map so you're not wasting a ton of time looking for spores or zombies or just whatever you need to do because let's face it, time is of the essence. Tombstone is obviously a much more helpful perk now. If you bleed out, you can come back to your next game and find your loot on a tombstone pinned right on your map. But the perk I am most disappointed with is Elemental Pop because in Cold War, it was baked with Electric Cherry and that's no longer present in this rendition of zombies. And from where I'm sitting, that is blasphemous. Electric Cherry would come in handy in so many situations here when you're cramped up in an infested nest or in an infected stronghold. Just being surrounded by zombies and not being able to just like fry them with electricity is just such a problem in my mind. I honestly can't believe it's not here. There are also just tons of gameplay quality of life features. There really is a lot to discuss here that just makes this mode feel full and flushed out and just really, really well thought out. Things like redeploy drones and ether portals so that you can reposition yourself around the map through the air, buy stations and weapon caches so that you can resupply whenever you want, wall weapons, mystery boxes which help you get higher tier rarity items and wonder weapons, gas stations, vehicles, the dark ether motorcycle which allows you to traverse around the map and even drive on water. There are things to help solo players like turrets and the hellhound helper which are just great to take down tier 3 bosses like the mega abomination so that you can farm for loot. And probably my favorite quality of life feature is the adjustments to reload speed and reviving animation. So now they save when you reach a certain point. So if you reload your weapon up to about 80% and are interrupted by a zombie hitting you, when you go to reload it again, it will pick up from where you left off. And it's the same thing with reviving allies, as while they are reviving you or vice versa, the level of revive will slowly trickle down from where you left it, which prevents you from starting from scratch in case you have to abandon an ally and come back to it. You won't
won't have to start completely over with your revive. These features are fantastic and I am super happy to welcome them into the zombie system. And before we move on to the final topic, I want to quickly discuss the enemy variety because I'm a bit torn on this. Everything in this mode we have technically seen before in other games, whether it's Black Ops 3, 4, or Cold War, it really feels like we have been there and done that. And to be honest, it's okay in this case. We of course have our regular zombies, light armored zombies, heavy armored zombies, hellhounds, disciples, manglers, mimics, mega abominations. And while they don't exactly feel super fresh in the enemy department, I think Treyarch did a great job and made the right call, making the enemies feel much more intimidating, which isn't something I have felt in quite a while when playing COD Zombies. And we know for a fact that the bosses aren't intimidating, so might as well make the regular enemies intimidating so that difficulty level is up there. And the mega abominations, they are fantastic. When you grab a bounty contract inside of the tier three zone and you start marching towards that map marker and the mega abomination appears on your screen, it feels like you are on a safari hunt taking down a wild animal. Going up against him, even with a fully pack-a-punch tier three weapon is still challenging. But when you finally overcome the insurmountable odds while simultaneously fending off all of the other enemies, it is a glorious moment. However, there are some issues when it comes to enemy design, especially with the disciples and the enemy AI. Disciples inside of Modern Warfare Zombies are quite ridiculously spongy, which mostly happens during the bounty contract, which is a problem on solo, considering that they replenish their health faster than you can deplete theirs. The enemy AI, on the other hand, is also a big problem inside of MWZ. Now, initially I was very against having AI soldiers inside of any zombies mode, and to some extent I still am, and this mostly had to do with the fact that there were many instances where I was just minding my own business, killing zombies, or running from point A to point B, and I would just get blasted by a group of mercenaries, or even a mercenary helicopter would follow me and just shoot missiles at me, and I'm just one soldier running in an open field. Where are you supposed to get cover? It's super frustrating, and in my opinion, doesn't belong in a PvE mode like this at all. However, now that I understand where the enemy encampments are on the map, and I understand how they work with their attack radius and whatnot, they are much easier to avoid. And if for whatever reason you have to take them head on with perks and a pack a punched weapon, they are ridiculously easy to kill. They also drop tons of armor plates and ammo, which will always put you on the upper hand of virtually any encounter. They're mostly just annoying more than anything else, but overall the way it feels to upgrade your weapons, become overpowered with perks, shoot and take down zombies, bosses and soldiers, it all just feels really fucking good. And I want this feeling to continue into other games, but there needs to be more changes made in some other departments, which we will get into a moment when we wrap up here. If you have made it this far into the review, I think it's pretty clear that I am pretty mixed on how I feel about this mode. On one hand, the gameplay and combat is excellently curated for solo and co-op zombies players alike, but on the other hand, the story is one step below garbage, there is no art direction or world building, and it doesn't feel like COD Zombies in the way us hardcore fans want it to feel. So while I still do recommend playing Modern Warfare Zombies, or at least giving it a chance, when you add the issues of performance on top of it, it's really hard for me to stand behind the product, at least in its current state. So performance has been extremely spotty over the last week and a half. Initially, I was experiencing a ton of crashes, and this was on PS5 and PC, mostly on PC, but it was happening everywhere. Now, normally, I don't think crashes are the end of the world, especially with constant save data and cloud saves and all of that good stuff, but this mode is predicated on not dying, and if you die or it crashes, you will lose everything that you have progressed to and have to start completely over, and it is maddening. I have experienced host disconnections, full-on application crashes, server dropping, my own username was logged out, but the worst offender of all is that MWZ would push players into Act 1's ending boss fight with Dr. Jensen, even if you didn't consent to being there. So a couple of times I spawned in with some perks or whatever, and I would be forced to do a final encounter I wasn't prepared for, and I would either have to quit or just die. Now, some of this stuff has been fixed, specifically the bug that pushes you into other people's missions. And yes, I don't seem to be experiencing nearly as many crashes as I was in the beginning, but I'm also not playing the mode as much right now because I'm working on this video as opposed to just grinding incessantly. That being said, the game runs like absolute dog water due to connection, loading, and packet burst issues. So this is likely going to take a few patches to get sorted out. So just be patient and beware before you go into this thinking that it's all safe and sound. But I do want to say one 
one positive thing really quick before we wrap this section up. When the game works well, it works very well. And it even works on the Asus ROG Ally running at 1080p, clocking in at over 60 frames per second. So when the game wants to run, it will run even on a handheld machine. So don't be discouraged. It's not your machine. It's not your console. It's just Activision, Treyarch, and Sledgehammer not having their shit together. So just be patient. Things will probably get ironed out over time. Modern Warfare Zombies is a big step in a very strange and different direction than I think anyone ever thought Treyarch would end up taking. And that leads me to ask you the following questions. What is Call of Duty Zombies? Is it simply surviving round after round in a tight enclosed space? Or is it going on an epic adventure with fantastical narratives and boss fights? Or is it an open world experience that is based on pushing through hordes of the undead, collecting loot, and exfilling back to safety. While we all likely have different definitions of COD Zombies, I think we can all agree that MWZ is a big shift and expansion of that definition that pushes the mode into new uncharted and perhaps unstable territory. I personally don't believe this to be COD Zombies even if it has some overlapping moments and features that make it appear to resemble the mode that we all know and love. Treyarch made a big mistake by calling this COD Zombies which was either intentionally misleading marketing at worst or gross negligence at best. And based on what we have become accustomed to over the years, it simply isn't fair to lead the hardcore community along like this while delivering on a completely different experience to a completely different and new section of the player base. We have no idea what to expect when it comes to Treyarch's next game, their next mode, their next map, their next, well, anything. And while before I used to feel a very deep level of concern about the status of zombies, I have now come to a point of surrender, to this point where I just have to let go. The glory days of BO2, BO3, Infinite Warfare, World War II, BO4, it's something I will always look back upon fondly, but those days are gone and they're not coming back. Now this isn't to say that Zombies is dead, obviously it's not, Cold War was a huge success, but it's just to say that it's different. So while I do recommend MWZ, and it's much better than I thought it would be, I can't help but feel unsure about where this mode is headed. We all have to trust that Treyarch knows what they are doing, and if they mess it up, well, it's on them. And while success and positive reception of this mode shows that Treyarch is still able to make great content when they set their minds to it, it's still concerning because those efforts should be focused on the round-based model.